of the people who are responsible for this. Is it an act of war in your mind? I don't know that I, I don't know that I want to use those words. I think the president is the one that has to respond, and I think what he has to know is that all of us in New York support him and uh, support him completely in the efforts that he's going to have to make over the next couple of days, week, and to make a point that, uh, that people can't do this. You can't attack innocent men, women, and children. Uh, and ultimately, I'm totally confident that American democracy and the American rule of law will prevail. And the people of New York are going to help to demonstrate that over the next couple of days. How many people Anybody take Carol? responsibility for this? Any group take responsibility at this time? And what is the city doing to safeguard the citizens now that something like this happens? Well, uh, first of all, I don't know if anyone has taken responsibility for it at this time. And secondly, the, the uh, New York City Police Department is fully deployed, not just in the rescue effort, but all throughout the city of New York. Uh, offering as much protection and as much security as we're capable of for the citizens of the city. And uh, at this point, I believe that the people in New York City can demonstrate our resolve and our support for all the people that were viciously attacked today by going about their lives and showing everyone that vicious, cowardly terrorists can't stop us from being a free country and a place that uh, functions. And we'll do everything we can to make that point. Please. Just to have, can you please tell us what's going to happen to the New York primary? <laughs> uh, this morning I, I issued an order suspending the primary across the state. There will be no primary today and we'll reschedule it once we get through this. Jennifer, please. Can you please walk us through the municipal services right now, what's going on with the subways and the schools, the courts? The subway, the, the, the schools, uh, the, the chancellor, uh, I, I, I commend the chancellor. He was on the phone a number of times with us. He coordinated very, very carefully what what would happen. He thought it out and he came up with a very good plan, which was essentially to keep the schools open, to keep the children in school so we didn't have a large number of children in, in the different boroughs that would be released from school. They're being, uh, they're being released, uh, not, I, I shouldn't say as normal, but basically on the normal schedule. Uh, if parents aren't there to pick up the young children, then the children will be taken to uh, a center and the parents will be notified to come and pick them up. The children who have metro cards who normally travel on the subway will be able to do that. The subways are functioning in four of the five boroughs. And uh, can we get an update, Joe, on how the subway is doing all, in Manhattan? All the lettered lines are working. And in Manhattan? In Manhattan lines, all the lettered lines. All the lettered lines are working, including in Manhattan. And throughout the rest of the city, public transportation is, is normal. So the children should be able to return from school in the normal fashion. And if any children don't have parents to pick them up, then we'll hold them, let the parents know, and then the parents can come Mr. and pick Mayor, them up. Mr. Mayor, you What's mentioned you were on Barclay Street. What's the radius of damage that's been affected? Uh, how many other side streets around the world? I don't think we know yet. Uh, th that, the whole area of Lower Manhattan has been uh, very much affected by it. Uh, how, how, many how many police and fire are involved? How many police and fire are involved? Like how many, all NYPD, off duty officers, that they come in? Like all, all NYPD and FDNY, uh, Offices are on on duty now, and we're going to need all of them. And we're and again, thanks to the governor and uh, the way in which the state reacted, we will have uh, 15, 1600 National Guard to relieve them over over a period of time, so we can get some relief for them. Is anybody so, looking for someone that may have been in the World Trade Center or in and around that area? What should they do? How can they do it? We're going to give you numbers so that we can try to help coordinate that. Individual businesses have already done that. But we will, we will, as soon as we can uh, find some time from the uh, relief efforts, give you a number in which people can call, and then we can direct them to the right place. The, the National Guard loading or anything like that? Like that any lawlessness? There, there have been no reports of lawlessness. No the governor of New York State, Governor George Pataki, the mayor, Mayor Giuliani, between him, the police commissioner just over on the right side of the picture there, the fire commissioner, the police commissioner more than anybody else being... Uh, almost a restraining influence there, trying to to say both to the governor and to the mayor, be be careful what you say here. We don't have, we don't have information on this, that, and the other thing. And on this question of casualties, it is the mayor who is attested to what everybody's got going, rushing around in their minds at the moment. More casualties, more than anyone can bear, but not willing to make perfect sense. Not willing at this point to put a number on the people who they believe. Um, have been killed and or injured. Uh, the, the mayor did say that in one of the parks in, in the lower part of Manhattan, 1,500 people were regarded as, as, as walking wounded. Uh, they were um, aware of 600 people in local hospitals, and New York City has 170 hospitals, and as the mayor said, 
Uh, every one of them is available under these circumstances. And there are 150 critical conditions which were taken out, which were medevaced out or taken out under other circumstances, some of them going across uh, the river to New Jersey. And in one case, according to the Canadian television network, uh, saying had been airlifted as far away as Canada uh, in order to, uh, to get special medical care. Canada has a very strong, uh, several very strong centers in burn treatment. So it may be one of the reasons that, that, pass, that uh, patients have gone uh, up that far. The mayor returning again to this thing which has clearly moved him, I think, more than anything else today, uh, getting down there and seeing the two trade towers before they collapsed on themselves and seeing the fires burning up high. And he said it every time and seeing the people jumping from the top of the trade towers, um, driven uh, to their deaths by the encroaching fire in the, in the rooms in which they no longer felt they were particularly safe. And Governor Pataki, uh, I think the first person today to say in the clearest language has got to be retaliation. Lots of people said, if you find out who has done this, you've got to be held accountable. Uh, mayor being reluctant to say whether or not the country was in a state of war, um, which is a technical thing, I think, for him in many ways. Um, but that's pretty much, I think, the summary of their, of the highlights of their news conference in which there seems to be um, a real coordination uh, between the local and the state and the federal. And we have here with us um, a man who should know whether or not it's working, Jerry Hauer, who's the former head of New York City Mayor's Office of Emergency Management. And the last time I saw you was in that place on the west side of Manhattan, which you had designed for just an event or maybe an event not just like this. Yeah, th this certainly is um, uh, an incredible event, Peter. Um, I don't think in our wildest imagination uh, you could think about a day where uh, simultaneous attacks, you know, we all think about it, we plan for it, but uh, to have something like this occur is, is uh, uh, certainly, um, uh, I view it as an attack mm. on our nation. But, uh, but was it, I understand your, I understand your emotional state, I'd like sure. everybody's the same, I think we're all the same. Sure. Did you never consider that this was a possibility? Well, we, um, we consider, and as we plan for New York City, we plan for massive events. Um, in point of fact, one of the things that we did when I was still heading up OEM, was we put in place um, uh, memorandums of understanding with New Jersey, with Connecticut, Nassau, Suffolk County, uh, to ensure that um, the, uh, there was enough medical care available, that uh, we had ambulances, police, firefighters, because we, uh, we had to plan for uh, horrific types of events. Uh, and as I told you when you were down, uh, we planned for uh, various types of incidents, mm. chemical and biological uh, uh, types of attacks, for um, uh, explosive types of uh, attacks. Mm. Um, you know, this, this is clearly uh, an, an, just a, a devastating uh, type mm. of an incident here in the city. The Office of Emergency Management office, that bunker, it's a pretty elegant bunker, and nor is it underground, it was second and third floor, right. I think. That's out of operation at the moment. Yeah, my understanding That's is... something you never planned for. Yeah, well, in fact, we did. Uh, um, the alternate uh, was to go to police headquarters or to another location um, in the event uh, that the command center was um, uh, inactivated for some reason or uh, rendered useless. Um, my Do you know what has happened to it today? Do you know yeah. precisely what's happened? To it? I talked to some folks down there, and my understanding is that a lot of the debris has fallen and uh, has blocked uh, the access to the building. Um, I've heard some uh, reports that the, they're concerned about the structural stability of the building, uh, but um, I, I have not been able to confirm that. But as part of our plan, uh, there were backups. Um, you always have black backups mm. in your planning, sure. and uh, that's what the city is doing today. Now, you've had to walk to get here today, and that's perfectly sure. understandable. We're on the west side of Manhattan, and, and things are that difficult. But do you have a sense of how it's going? And uh, We've heard the mayor's appraisal and accepted as an honest one. Do you have any sense of how the system's working, and do you have any sense of how many people are still trapped or dead? Well, I, uh, first of all, I think that um, uh, things are working um, uh, as they should. I think that, you know, when you've got uh, the best police and fire department uh, anywhere in the world, 
Um, it, they are doing um, everything to try and rescue people, to try and uh, get near the building. But you've got to also realize the dynamics in a situation like this change a bit when you have a number of police and firefighters injured as well. Sure. And that's what we saw this morning. Uh, the, the, uh, I was listening to the fire radio this morning when the building collapsed and they were uh, uh, screaming for help because firefighters were trapped. So the, the, the emotion changes a bit, but these are extremely professional people. These are uh, very heroic people. They will do everything they can uh, to uh, try and get in and rescue anybody that could potentially be alive in that building, recognizing that there is a potential for additional collapse. What about the prospect, as the governor has announced, of the National Guard being called into New York for an act of terrorism? Is this anything you ever envisioned, and what will they do? Well, in fact, it, 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 that's the question, uh, John, what, what they'll do. I, I would imagine that they will help support uh, the, the police department, the fire department, uh, provide logistical support, manpower, help with search and rescue. Whether or not they'll be used for law enforcement purposes, uh, traffic control, things like that, I think uh, I, I've not been privy to those discussions, so I, I don't know. But that's certainly possible. Leading up to the millennium, you personally designed a series of exercises where a disaster would unfold and they would respond to it. A tabletop exercise, a field sure. exercise, and then another disaster, yep. and then another, to make it more and more difficult to stretch the resources to the limit was that worst case scenario design that you that you put together to see if the city could handle such a momentous disaster anything close to this or have a component like this yeah you know as we were planning for the millennium we were planning for uh, millions of people in times square and for the potential of something happening there um, and we had to look at where all those resources would come so from. So did you have in your in your design, did you have a truck bomb go off and then something else and then something else happened? We had a sequence of events, both um, explosions, chemicals, biological incidents, and we looked at various types of um, terrorist events. And, uh, you know, I think that what you're seeing uh, here today is the result of uh, having uh, the New York City Fire Department, New York City Police Department, um, well prepared, but again, uh, I don't care where you are anywhere in the country, anywhere You're in the world. For this. Uh, an incident like this is difficult and certainly stresses um, any system um, anywhere in the world. And then when you have a number of injuries to police and firefighters, it really does um, change the dynamics. Did you ever imagine in your various scenarios that a building, not to mention two separate buildings sure. basically, in case of the trade tires, would collapse on one another? We, uh, we did plan for building collapse, for bombings, um, uh, and uh, uh, that was part of uh, our routine planning. Uh, is, there some, is there some hint there of what the, the, the operation now faces in terms of what you went through? Well, what happens from here on out is uh, a very slow process because, mm. first of all, you've got to put the fire out, and my understanding is uh, there's gas lines feeding the fire, and uh, it, it is not out. Uh, so before you can really start doing a search and rescue in the middle of the building or, or even recovering uh, those uh, victims, uh, you've mm. got to get that fire out. Yeah. Uh, the mayor did just say a moment ago the gas has been turned off in city buildings. That would seem to be uh, to have alleviated one very pressing problem for much of the morning. Yes, um, but uh, we still see that it's burning. Um, we see that um, it continues to burn and uh, you can do some search and rescue um, uh, around the periphery of what's burning, but to actually get into the area that's burning, uh, this is this is going to be a long-term uh, process. John, now you mentioned something uh, about continuity of government, contingency plans. What are we seeing in New York and in Washington, where the officials are not, where we're accustomed to seeing them, not in the White House, not operating out of City Hall? Uh, have they gone to ground? You have to in a situa situation like this, when you view that the, the country has been attacked, um, you have to have alternative, si alternative sites for, uh, for the mayor, uh, for the governor to operate from, to continue government. Uh, On the assumption that their regular sites are potential targets? Oh, sure. You, you have to do that. Uh, and uh, uh, I would imagine that's uh, what's happening in Washington as well. Uh, they Good afternoon. This is Maureen Bunyan in the ABC7 newsroom. Uh, you are looking at a live picture 
of the Pentagon, which is still on fire. There apparently uh, is smoke coming out. Uh, obviously, is smoke coming out. We assume it is still on fire, uh, with officials trying to get that blaze contained uh, since uh, this morning's uh, terrorist attack on the building. It has now been five hours since that terrorist attack, since a plane slammed into the Pentagon. This was the scene at approximately 10 o'clock this morning when that plane struck the Pentagon. It penetrated the outer wall and then it made its way into the, uh, the inner corridor at the Pentagon. As you might imagine, at that moment, all people were told to evacuate the Pentagon, which they did. The rescue efforts have been underway now since then. We have some video now of the people that are being evacuated, both medically and otherwise. We are not receiving detailed information at this point as to just what the full numbers are, just what the full damage was. We know that the Pentagon itself staffs 20,000 people. No idea at this point just how many people may have been inside at the time. And Dell, uh, here's the situation in the skies over the United States at this moment. Uh, the Federal Aviation uh, 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 FAA says that all of commercial aircraft flights have now reached their destinations. No additional takeoffs are being allowed in the aftermath of today's attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. And the FAA also says that no troubles have been reported with any more flights across the United States. And obviously there are those in our area that are trying to get information about loved ones who may have been on those flights. The American Airlines information number is there on your screen. It is 1-800-245-0999. And also it is believed that two of the flights may have been United Airlines flights. 1-800-932-8555 is the number you can call for United Airlines information, and we will keep uh, putting those up for you throughout the afternoon. And also here in the district, the district has been declared a state of emergency. The mayor made that declaration earlier this afternoon at a press conference. Here's some of what he had to say then. Again, you, you, we're, we're uh, declaring a state of emergency in order to put everyone on alert, in order to uh, ensure that we have the highest level of preparedness. Obviously, if something were to happen, God forbid, and we pray, pray that it won't, uh, we will be fully prepared uh, to then execute uh, the necessary contingency plans. And the mayor says he will have further news conferences this afternoon at 4 o'clock and 5 o'clock to bring us up to date on the situation in the district. We also need to update you right now to the extent of the state of emergency in the district as to what you can and you can't do. There are several road closings that we need to tell you about. Route 50, 66, 29, and the GW Parkway are all closed inbound from Virginia. They are open only for medical personnel. Once again, inbound into to the district. Routes 50, 66, 29, and the GW Parkway are all closed inbound. Route 1 is also closed outbound from D.C., and Route 395 northbound, we are told, which is outbound, is also closed. And, Dell, uh, some more traffic information for you folks. Uh, VRE says it now has very limited service this afternoon. Mark train service remains suspended. It is running buses at some of the stations, but, uh, and the buses are not on any schedule, but the train service is suspended. And we want to reiterate that this has been a two-pronged terrorist attack. Of course, the worst and more severe attack happening in New York City. And then there is the attack on the Pentagon itself. We are coordinating our efforts with ABC News to bring you the most information that we possibly can. We're going to return to ABC News and Peter Jennings right now. Of the White House. Um, John McCrethy, who covers the Pentagon, national security, and a good deal of terrorism and international intelligence issues for us, is at the Pentagon. John, what have you got? Uh, a whole plate full of things, Peter. First of all, uh, we've been talking throughout the day about possible ship movements, American ship movements. It is true that two aircraft carriers, five other combatants, and a hospital ship are now all heading north uh, along the Atlantic seaboard toward New York. No decision has yet been made about exactly what to do with those ships when they get there, but of course aircraft carriers have a very large hospital capability, so they could be used for that. I think it is a, a responsive measure. Defense Secretary Rumsfeld, after the attack on the Pentagon, went immediately to the gash that you see behind me here when the very first destruction was, uh, was detected uh, and helped pull some people out of the rubble. He is now in what is called the National Military Command Center in the Pentagon, and he intends to stay there indefinitely uh, until all forces around the world have been secured. All forces uh, around the globe at this point are at ThreatCon Delta, which is the highest uh, level of threat condition that American troops can be in. 
Um, one of the difficulties with the fire and the rescue effort here in the Pentagon, Peter, is uh, we have seen continuous outbreaks of fires within the different levels of the Pentagon, and it has been extremely difficult for search and rescue people to get inside the Pentagon. It was five hours before the first people were able to get into some of the rubble uh, to try to begin to pull out people who may have been trapped. Uh, it, the fire in the Pentagon was described as an inferno by those people who were in some of the worst areas. Uh, the evacuation in parts of the Pentagon was very orderly. Some of it was complete chaos, as you might expect. Okay, John, thanks very much. John McCreffy at the Pentagon. We just take a quick look at John there. <clears throat> um, Jackie, you there for a second? I want to yeah, put John on camera for a second because... You, earlier today, you described, you just turn around and take a look at that gash in the Pentagon there, and describe again for us, you think it's what, 200 feet wide, two to 300 feet wide? It is uh, at least two or 300 feet wide, Peter. Uh, just imagine a very large commercial aircraft ramming into this mm. space. Uh, the Pentagon is built like a blockhouse, as you know, during World War II. Uh, it is a very substantial building, and this aircraft, traveling at between 150 mm. and 200 miles an hour, penetrated deeply into the, uh, the rings of the Pentagon, almost to the center. Uh, the destruction on the five floors that are above ground is considerable. Uh, the, one of the admirals was briefing us earlier that uh, he felt that the section that was hit uh, was one of the areas that was being repaired. We now believe that is not true. Um, it is an area that was very fully staffed, primarily with Navy and Marine Corps personnel, but also the Defense Intelligence Agency. Okay, thanks very much, John McCarthy at the Pentagon. We'll come back to you. On the phone with us at the moment is the former CIA Director James Woolsey. Mr. Woolsey, there's so much to ask you about at a moment like this in terms of your experience, but um, as our political director, or actually that's not true, as a former senior White House official said a short while ago to one of us, there's going to be a hellacious amount of finger pointing at the moment. What's, ha what's gone wrong here? Well, one thing that's gone wrong, Peter, I think, is that for some years now, uh, we have adopted a theory that terrorism first was uh, likely just to be uh, sort of a pickup team, these loose associations of uh, terrorists inspired, say, by the blind shake in New York. This was the thought in the two bombings, uh, one attempted, one real in New York uh, back in the early 90s. And then uh, uh, the Clinton administration veered off into saying everything looked like it might be uh, Osama bin Laden. Uh, it's important that we realize there is a real possibility when you have something this devastating and well-coordinated that there could be state action of some sort behind it. Now, I don't know that that's the case, and I won't say that it's the case. Uh, but there is at least a plausible case that there was Iraqi government involvement in the World Trade Center bombing back in 1993. Uh, this all has to do with the identity, the true identity of Ramzi Youssef, who uh, was the mastermind who's in prison uh, out in Colorado now at his sentencing. The judge said, we still don't really know uh, who you are. And uh, if there was a chance that there was Iraqi government involvement in that, since Yusuf was the mastermind of the World Trade Center and of a bombing plot in the Pacific, uh, which he was working on when he was caught to have a lot of American uh, airlines in the Pacific blown up, uh, what happened today is a sort of amalgam of the earlier two Ramsey Yusuf uh, plots. Um, it's at least, I think, interesting uh, that that's the case. And, uh, and uh, if some of the observers, Laurie Milroy and others, are correct, that there's a reasonable chance that he was, in fact, involved with the Iraqi government, uh, there could also be a chance that the Iraqi government is involved here, even if bin Laden or other terrorist groups are as well. Uh, can, can I just ask you uh, just a couple of really elementary questions about intelligence? Y you've just done something on the air which strikes me as what intelligence officers do when they sit down to try to figure out what the heck is going on. Is that, is that in fact, what you're trying to do at the moment? You called it an amalgam of two plots. Is that, how it, is that how it works at the moment? Well, this is nothing but circumstantial uh, evidence that I've been talking about, but it's interesting circumstantial uh, information anyway. And yes, that's the sort of thing that I think intelligence officers need to do. Part of the problem with the World Trade Center bombing back in 93 is that most of the information about it uh, was under grand jury secrecy until uh, the trial, and after that not many people uh, 
paid attention to it. So even most of the federal government had no access to it except outside the FBI now, and parts of justice. Now you mentioned uh, you mentioned governments and individual organizations or operations. Don't governments traditionally leak information more than than independent or semi-independent terrorist cells? If there were a government involved, is it is it not inconceivable that the United States didn't pick up something? I think it's uh, possible that uh, a government could be involved and not uh, be picked up, especially if it was operating very carefully as the Iraqis or conceivably the Iranians might uh, under these circumstances. Uh, it is normally somewhat easier to learn what's going on inside a government than a, a terrorist group, particularly one that uh, doesn't uh, uh, use many communications uh, and the like and uh, does everything within just a very small number of people. Uh, but it's not impossible that terrorist groups could work together with the government. Uh, that uh, the Iraqi government has been quite closely involved with a number of the Sunni uh, uh, terrorist uh, groups, and uh, and on some matters has uh, had contact with Go Bin ahead. Laden. So, I'm sorry, Mr. Olsey, I think I just lost you. No, I said on some Our matters at the moment, and I hope we'll get him back on the telephone. The former director of the CIA, James Woolsey, on the phone, uh, agreeing that there's going to be a heck of a lot of finger pointing at the FBI at the at the Department of Defense uh, and at the CIA. Now, I have my FBI, thank you very much. Um, I just lost the director of the CIA. Okay, thank you very much. Um, because, as this former official in the, in, in the White House points out, people are going to demand massive retaliation. Mr. Woolsey ra raises uh, quite uh, two quite fascinating uh, possibilities. One, that there is a terrorist organization or group involved with a government, that there is, as there has been believed in the past, a terrorist operation within the Iranian political establishment, which perhaps even other parts of the Iranian political establishment didn't know about, um, and similarly true, though much likely for them to be operating in ignorance of Saddam Hussein uh, inside Iraq as well. Uh, but the reason that, um, and I bring John Miller back briefly in on this again, the reason he suggests an amalgam, um, Mr. Woolsey does, of two footprints is because of the potential, never perfectly prove that Ramza Youssef, who has been on trial and convicted of the first trade tower attack, did seem to have some tenuous connection with Iraq. And that this is a mixture of, of the two plots right. that were, were his two um, big capers. Right. Uh, one, the plot to blow up numerous airlines on the Pacific route uh, targeting American tourists. The other, um, the other to uh, blow up the World Trade Center here planes, uh, American carriers have been used to attack the World Trade Center. Okay, uh, I, 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 I apologize. As, no, as, as, as Mr. Woolsey pointed out, the difficulty with Ramzi Youssef and really getting to the bottom of the World Trade Center was while he escaped as the mastermind and while he was captured in a, a guest house funded by bin Laden, nobody ever knew who sent him in the first place uh, or what his real nationality was or even what his real name was, which set him apart from all the other people connected with those cases, truly a mystery man, still in prison here in America. Yeah, somebody said a few, uh, a little while ago, too, uh, in terms of everything we're looking at now, suspects, there's no good options on the table in this regard whatsoever. Let's try to keep up with the running developments of the day. Lisa Stark is with us from Seattle. She covers aviation for us. And Lisa, when we last, uh, when we last commented on the status of this plane, we have at least one I beg your pardon, at least two of them in the process of being hijacked. Right. Peter, here's, here's, what we, here's the latest information we know right now. Uh, we know, obviously, the two American planes were lost, Flight 11 from Boston to L.A. That is one of the planes that went into the World Trade Tower. Flight 77 from Dulles to Los Angeles. We believe that that may have been the plane that went into the Pentagon. The two United planes, United 93, that is the plane that crashed south of Johnstown, Pennsylvania. And now United 175, that plane, the plane from Boston to Los Angeles, a government source has confirmed that that was the second plane that went into one of the World Trade Towers in New York. I'm also being told by government sources, and again, these things change throughout the day, Peter, and you know, I want to caution people, but this mm -hmm. is what we know now. A government source tells me that on American Airlines Flight 11, again, that was the flight from Boston to Los Angeles that went into the Trade Tower, that a flight attendant on that plane was apparently able to call the American Airlines Operations Center to tell them that two flight attendants had been stabbed and that the perpetrators had broken into the flight deck. 
We've also been told that a passenger aboard one of the United flights, United Flight 93, the one that crashed in Pennsylvania, a passenger on that flight was able to call 911 apparently and let them know that the plane was being hijacked. Again, this information from government right. sources, and we don't know if it will hold up throughout the day, but that's what we are being told at this I, time. I very much appreciate you bringing us up to date. There's one thing that I don't, I'm never quite clear on yet, and that maybe just because where I'm sitting. Do we know American Airlines Flight 11 from Boston to Los Angeles was a 767, is that correct? Correct, yes. Um, United Airlines 175, which went into the World Trade Center. That was a 767, a 767 as, well. as well. The American aircraft plane, which we're a little uncertain about the crashing into the Pentagon, was an American, was it Boeing 757? Correct. And the, it was also a 757 that crashed near Johnstown. Exactly. So, so we have t two very popular and very widely used and very important aircraft in these two airlines uh, being used. Lisa, thanks very much indeed. Uh, on the phone from Washington with us now is the former Secretary of State, James Baker. Are you there, Mr. Baker? I'm here, Peter. Um, so what would you do? Well, it's a pretty tough one, Peter. It's uh, everybody, of course, uh, is in is in deep sorrow and shock. Uh, it seems to me that this is something we've been worried about for a long time. We've been able, fortunately, to uh, foreclose it uh, up to now. We may be entering a bit of a new era. We may have to do a bit more to preempt these types of events. We may need to get some better human intelligence to penetrate some of these groups uh, before acts like this can be can be carried out. Uh, we may need to do even more to beef up, obviously, I suppose we need to do even more to beef up our airport security. There's a lot, uh, there's a lot uh, along those lines, I think, that needs to be done and, and uh, mostly, I think, strengthen our intelligence capabilities. You are the second person, uh, 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 second senior former government official to say to us today to imply very clearly that human intelligence um, in those areas of the world which are to some extent breeding grounds of terrorism are plainly weak. Well, they are weak, Peter. We took, you know, we, we went on a real uh, witch hunt with our CIA back in the early uh, mid-70s. We had hearings. I won't mention the name of the, uh, of the legislator who conducted those hearings, but they, in effect, uh, resulted in our eliminating a lot of our human intelligence capabilities. It's a dirty business. When you're when you have human intelligence, you're doing business with uh, pe the kinds of people that will, that will commit uh, these acts. Uh, sometimes the first test of a, of a human intelligence agent, uh, the first test they send them out on is to go out and kill somebody. So it's pretty tough for America to, uh, to, to get into that, and we got out of it. But it may be that we have to get into that kind of business. Uh, Mr. Secretary, why don't you just name the legislator, because you're just going to make cause more trouble for me to go to the file and look it up. Who, who held these hearings, and what's the point you're trying to make? That well, there's they were the church committee hearings, and what I did, what I think we did uh, as a consequence of those hearings was to, in effect, unilaterally disarm in terms of our in intelligence capabilities. Now, we have the best, you know, we have the best uh, technological intelligence gathering operations and capabilities in the world, but we need this human intelligence to penetrate groups like the group that must have carried out this, uh, these operations. I have only a vague recollection of this, but I think the point you're making is that there are some forces, political and otherwise in the United States, who believe that getting down and dirty with potential terrorists around the world is not something we should be doing, that we should do it all technically, therefore not put people at risk? That's correct. That was the thinking, and that's pretty much the, uh, pretty much the policy we followed mm. since then, and I think we need to get back into the down and dirty business so we can penetrate these groups and hopefully prevent these types of things from happening in the future. Mr. Bick, I don't want to get ahead of things, and I'm sure you do not either, but if there is... Uh, and as somebody said earlier, there are no good options out there at the moment. But do you believe that the United States is, if it finds out that a state is involved, are going to have to go to war in an active way against that state? Well, first of all, I don't believe we're going to find out that a state is involved. Mm. I cannot really, frankly, conceive of a state doing this. There could be, I suppose, some indirect assistance from a state or groups within a state. And I don't think that's going to be the case. But if it were the case, I think we need to do uh, whatever, whatever we reasonably and responsibly can to protect the American people, whatever that involves. Now, this is always the toughest question for somebody who has been in office but is not currently. How much easier is it to say what you do now that you're not in government? In other words, were you still, were you the man, were you the Secretary of State 
in the Bush administration at, at the moment. Now, would you not feel rather constrained by modern circumstances as to what you could do? Well, I don't know. I mean, there, you know, we have, we, we, frankly, uh, Peter, we have some uh, laws on our books that we ought to take a look at. One of them is simply a presidential executive order that says the United States doesn't go out and assassinate people. I think there was a very good reason behind that, but I dare say that you would have about 99%, uh, if not 100%, public support across the United States today if we found out that one terrorist group was responsible for this, for these incidents. Uh, you would have 100% support almost for for uh, taking care of that of the person who leads that group. One of the difficulties, of course. Uh, Mr. Baker, is that w in, a, in a situation like this, we end up fighting like the terrorists to some extent, right? Well, that, that, that is unfortunately the case. That's mm -hmm. true. But, but it may be that that's the only way we can really mm -hmm. take care of the problem. You know, the president said today, he made a statement I think was absolutely the right statement. He said, he said uh, America is under attack, uh, under terrorist attack, and mm -hmm. he said we are going to hunt down and punish those we find responsible for this. And uh, that, to my way of thinking, means doing whatever is required. Mr. Baker, thanks very much for the time. Thank you. James sir. Baker, the former Secretary of State, also widely known in the country as the man who uh, did as much as he did to uh, win Florida for George Bush at the last uh, presidential election, but a longtime member of the American political and foreign policy establishment and who knows how complicated this is and who makes a very open, you'll hear this a lot in the next few days, not enough human intelligence and we'll review who that legislator was. Tony Cordesman, uh, our military analyst. Um, are you listening to Mr. Baker? Is he making sense? He is, Peter, but I think we need to have an important caution here. Human intelligence isn't as simple as it sounds. The actual agents can take years to develop Historically, they've often been unreliable, and the more hostile the ideology is, the more uncertain the collection. Human intelligence is also analysis. Our analytic side is weak. The CIA has had hiring freezes. There is so little money for CIA and for DIA that most of the country analysts have never been to the countries they're actually analyzing, much less talked to many of the elements within them. And as Secretary Baker pointed out, if you're going to go into operations, that's different from human intelligence, and our operations capability has been allowed to decline for nearly a decade. Thank you, Tony. The game has changed a good deal today, yeah. so let us get back. Yes, John. Before Sorry. Jerry Howard leaves us, right. and he's promised to come back, okay. um, all of the discussions we've had raised the question to me, and I know Jerry's been more fully briefed on these national security agencies than in uh, matters than any of us have, how many of these attacks have we known about and been able to prevent? How many that we've heard about? How many that we haven't heard about? And have any of them been on this scale? Uh, uh, that's difficult to answer, John, because a lot of that, um, a lot of that material is classified. A lot of that is kept classified. But uh, there clearly are a number of threats that are, occur in this country uh, almost on a daily basis. Uh, uh, some of them are, are hoaxes. Some of them are credible. Uh, some of them are quite, quite credible. Um, and uh, the, the spectrum varies. And um, they've, um, they've had uh, and some we've been very fortunate with, as we were right before the millennium with uh, uh, the, uh, the intrusion the, from Canada. Yeah, the, mm -hmm. but, that, but that was one that was the work of an alert agent. How many have we actually prevented through intelligence, which is, is kind of what Mr. Wolsey and Mr. Baker have been talking yeah, about? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure anybody has a good number on that. I, uh, that's something that I think that uh, would difficult, be difficult uh, to put your finger on at this point, I, you know, and it would be interesting to get that from the FBI. I'm not sure mm -hmm. that I've ever heard a number on how many we've actually um, uh, thwarted. Um, Have uh, you ever picked up the phone in your emergency management center and had someone on the other end who said we're going to blow up something? Um, we actually did receive a number of threats. What was uh, it like? Um, what did, what did... We had um, uh, some letters come in and we turned them over to the FBI. Um, by and large, we uh, felt that uh, the majority of them were hoaxes, mm. uh, but uh, we relied on the FBI for their, um, uh, their intelligence, for their um, uh, analysis mm. of threats. Uh, we relied on the Police Department Intelligence Division, um, and uh, by and large, uh, with the exception of uh, one or two that 
uh, were a little more credible than others. Most of them were pretty uh, lame hoaxes. I remember two of those that were quite serious. In, uh, in 94 and 95, uh, when I was with the police department, we received information from the FBI that there was going to be a truck bomb attack within 48 hours on the New York Stock Exchange. We responded by surrounding it literally with sanitation sand trucks. Um, and blocking the street and eventually set up a cordon which has still not come down. The other was uh, a planned attack on the uh, Israeli mission to the United mm -hmm. Nations uh, which has been surrounded by cement blocks, uh, first ever the sand trucks and, and ever since ever again. Since. Uh, our thanks to Jerry Hauer, the former head of the New York Mayor's Office of Emergency Management and Operations and as we said at the beginning it's an office which is not operating in the place that Jerry Hauer set it up which was right adjacent uh, to the World Trade Center, and it has been blocked off, put out of commission in one way or another by the horrendous, horrendous uh, devastation which has occurred in that part of town today. And we don't want to lose sight of it for a second in all this discussion about, about intelligence and terrorism. Uh, so I want to go back to George Stephanopoulos, uh, on the, at, who's, who's closer to the building than anybody else, and then Bill Blakemore. Uh, they are both watching. Uh, the search and rescue operations, um, uh, and, and uh, both report now. George? Well, Peter, we still don't know that it is a search and rescue operation yet. Just uh, a little while ago, one of the volunteers who tried to go down there and help reported back and said, when you actually got to the scene, and you see it behind me, that cloud of black smoke, when you actually got to the scene at the World Trade Center, what was most remarkable, what was most amazing, what was most horrifying is that basically nothing was happening. They couldn't go into the building and actually perform any real rescue operations. And he also described the scene very close to the World Trade Center, soot and silt up to his waist. He said it was hell. We have also talked to some firefighters who've gotten fairly close to the scene. They've now set up a special command center over here at Manhattan Borough Community College here on the west side where they're relieved, buried underneath all the dirt and debris, had to dig himself out, but still didn't know what had happened to his six partners George, who, had, who had gone into the building and near the building. George, can I just interrupt you for a sec? I'll come right back to you, but Ann Compton, who's been with the president all day, is on, on the phone from Nebraska, and we don't want to lose her if we can have her. Annie, can you hear me? Yes, Peter, I can. What are you doing in Nebraska? Well, uh, we didn't know where we were till we landed. President Bush is here at the home of the Strategic Command. This is the area, this is the base where those big doomsday aircraft are kept. And he has disappeared down the rabbit hole, Peter, uh, down through a red brick uh, small building. He and what skeleton staff are with him uh, down into an underground bunker where Ari Fleischer tells me the president is going to chair a National Security Council meeting by teleconference. I was also told that the president has been on the phone several times with the vice president who is able to work out of a command center uh, at the White House itself in one of the secure areas below in the White House. Annie, your description of the president going down the rabbit hole, going into a very secure uh, compound bunker in, in, in Nebraska at Offutt Air Force Base suggests that people in his entourage believe there has been a threat today or a potential threat to the highest political leadership in the country. Is that correct? Well, and I asked exactly that question. They say there was no hint of any warning of the attacks that came on the East Coast today. But as you know, they always take the precaution, especially once the Pentagon was hit, that the president might be a target as well. And uh, that is why he has come to as secure a place as he could, uh, where he is trying to marshal the forces. He's also talking to some of the civilian leaders on the ground, including Mayor Giuliani and Governor Pataki. Um, but we were told there was no direct threat to him and no advance warning, and that in itself, Peter, is distressing to the uh, very small number of staff of the president here at Offutt. So, so the procedures are in place, and, and they do what they do, right? Well, you know, in, in 27 years of covering presidents and crises, we have never played the kind of hunted game that uh, was played today where we would take off in the plane and not know where we were going to land. And then once we landed in Louisiana, where we were literally told not to use cell phones so our location couldn't be pinpointed, to take off again uh, and head to uh, the center. It, it does feel like a cat and mouse game. Ari Fleischer, when I asked him if the president feels in jeopardy or hunted, he said the president understands that this is kind of the precaution that is necessary at a time like this and that he's anxious to get back to Washington. And, and for example, when you 
phoned us just a moment ago. Thank goodness you did. Did you have to ask permission to do it? Uh, no, because it, it is hard to hide a great big airplane like Air Force One. And when we were coming in, I could tell we were over a flat area, a fairly <laughs> urban area. And uh, I guess it was Nebraska, knowing that uh, we hadn't been that far out of Louisiana. And indeed, as we came down over the field, I saw a satellite, a TV satellite truck out on the highway. <laughs> And sure enough, on our screens inside the plane, we watched ourselves land. The local media was already here figuring this is where the President of the United States and the Commander-in-Chief would land. Because it's part of the old Strategic Air Defense Command. Exactly right. It has the facilities, the secure facilities here, where the President can still be, as what Ari tells me is... I'm Del Walters reporting live from the ABC7 News Studios where we continue to cut in on every half hour to bring you up to date on the situation unfolding at the Pentagon. We now know a little bit more about the fire. ABC News is reporting that it is literally an inferno inside and also the District of Columbia Fire Department, we understand, has now sent the equivalent of three alarms worth of personnel and equipment to help Arlington and Pentagon firefighters just deal with the fire after the plane crashed into it this morning. Joining Dale, I'm Kathleen Matthews, and we're also getting confirmation now that the plane that crashed into the Pentagon was actually the flight that took off from Dulles Airport earlier this morning. Now, it's been five and a half hours since the plane crashed into the Pentagon. As you can see, a scene of tremendous building carnage there. Associated Press is now quoting anonymous law enforcement officials that say the plane that crashed into the Pentagon was American Airlines Flight 77. It had taken off from Dulles Airport and was bound for Los Angeles. That airline was carrying 58 people, 58 passengers, four flight attendants, and two pilots. ABC 7 News reporter Daryl Carver is live at the Pentagon right now and brings us up to date on everything that's been going on there this morning. Daryl? Kathleen, I want to set the scene for you for just a little bit. If we can take a look at the Pentagon right now, the fire here is still burning at this hour. We have been told that members of the Fairfax County Urban Rescue Team, that elite rescue team, is awaiting entry, but however, they are still waiting for the fire to be put out. We've been told it's, it is a scene of tremendous carnage inside of there. Most of the damage at this point, from what we understand, is in the E-ring or the outer ring of the Pentagon. As you can see, there are still fire crews being rushed in there. There are still emergency workers all throughout this scene. We're still trying to get a few more details on what the situation is at this point inside. And when we get those details, we will pass them on to you. For now, reporting live from the Pentagon, Daryl Carver, ABC 7 News. Back to you. Daryl, thank you very much. We want to update you on the injuries and also some more information with regards to the Pentagon plane crash. We now understand that it did not hit uh, a portion of the Pentagon that may have been under construction. And indeed, there were people. It was heavily occupied at the time. Now let's take a look at some of the injuries reports that we are receiving. Virginia Hospital Center is reporting at this hour that they have received 30 injured parties. Washington Hospital Center says that they have received five critical people, five people in critical condition. George Washington Hospital says that they have received two people, both of whom are in the emergency room. And Alexandria Anova Hospital, this is information that we just received, says it is treating 11 people, nine people all told, or nine people are in fair condition, one is in critical condition, and one person is in good condition. We will continue to uh, uh, cut into ABC News to bring you the very latest on the local situation. We'll be back again at 4 o'clock. Meanwhile, we join ABC News in progress. Some, some small indications and I, that, that the, the broader evacuation of the senior staff of the White House that is always planned for in emergencies, as you hinted at, from a relic from the Cold War days, has also gone into effect. I spoke with the, the hang on, George. Hang White on, House. George. I apologize. I'm only interrupting you because you're so... Okay, you don't have those sirens behind you. Go ahead. The sirens behind me. Sorry. I, I spoke earlier, just a little while ago, to the spouse of a senior White House official who received a call simply from the Secret Service saying, uh, your spouse is safe. Uh, is in a secure location right now. I remember from my early days, Peter, in the White House, several senior White House staff are given cards and have evacuation plans for places to go in cases of a national emergency. And as I said, it does seem to be, there does seem to be some indication that that may have been put into effect. I, I would just add one more note. You, Ann was talking about the possibility of the president doing now a teleconference with his, his senior national security right. officials. There are facilities in the White House, not the normal situation room, which everyone has seen in the past, has seen pictures of, but there is a second situation room behind the, the primary situation room, which has video conferencing capabilities. 
the, the director of the Pentagon, the defense chief can speak from the National Military Command Center at the Pentagon. The uh, Sec Secretary of State can speak from the State Department, the president from wherever he is. And they'll have this capability to video conference throughout this crisis. In my time at the White House, it was used in, af in the aftermath of the Oklahoma City bombing, in the aftermath of the TWA Flight 800 bombing, and, and that would be the way they would stay in contact through the afternoon. Uh, uh, just a couple of, uh, of, of short questions. Um, given where the president has gone from Florida to Louisiana to Nebraska, and given that we hear from the political staff that he'd like, they'd like him to come back to Washington, does the president have any say at the moment, basically, if the Secret Service says go left or go right or go here or go there? Well, the president has the ability to overrule them if he wants, but I think in this situation, Peter, he, he would follow their directions, obviously pushing them uh, to try to get back as soon as, as soon as he could, if that was really what his political advisors wanted. But, but he, would, he would take their direction on this one. Sometimes you can fight the Secret Service on, you know, how long you're going to spend in a rope line. I don't think you'd do it on this. Okie dokie. And the other question is, in terms of Dick Cheney, the vice president, is in the White House now. Just from a purely operational point of view, if you were trying to run things at the moment, would you like to be in the White House or in a bunker in Nebraska? Or would it make any difference? Um, well, it, it doesn't. I, I think right now, Peter, it doesn't make any difference. Air Force One and this bunker in Nebraska has complete communications all across the board. And as I said, my guess is that Vice President Cheney is in that second situation room. A camera is trained on him. He can see the president. The president can see him. They can see Secretary Rumsfeld, Secretary of State Powell. It's as if they're meeting in one room. Now tell me, let's, re let's return to the, the immediate business at hand. Uh, I, I, every time I check in with you or we check in with you, I hear sirens virtually right underneath you. What's going on right underneath you? Well, right underneath, I'm at Canal Street and the Avenue of Americas, which is about 20 blocks away from the World Trade Center there. Every once in a while, right outside my window right now, there are about four police vans and a police car. Um, they're, they're, but the police seem to just be stationing there, almost resting right now. The area right around us is quite quiet. About an hour ago, two hours ago, there were hordes of people walking uptown. That's pretty much stopped. Now, Peter, I got to tell you, it's very strange. You look down on the sidewalk, and you just have people strolling uh, in their summer clothes up in this neighborhood right here. But again, from what we've heard of that situation down by the World Trade Center, it's horrific. It's kind of eerily silent. The, the firemen are, are relieving each other every 15 minutes or so. They come out, they get showered down with fire hoses to get all the soot off, and then they go right back in and get to work. And, and just remind me one more time, George, the, you know, our, the, the layman's notion of a bunker is one thing out in Nebraska, and I assume the White House has another notion of bunker. What does it mean down the rabbit hole in, into the bunker? Well, in the bunker would just be certainly underground, mm -hmm. secure situation room, um, but but... The important point, Peter, is that wherever that bunker is, um, and it's reinforced by guards and concrete and all that, the president is in full communication with his entire national security team, and, and he can direct them at a moment's notice. And I think the big question that they're going to have to address now as they gather the facts, as they try and figure out who's responsible for this, uh, even though they want to get the president back to Washington as soon as possible, and I'm sure they'll do that, they won't want him to go before the country again until he has more to say, and probably until he can say what actually he's going to take um, in response to this. Okay, thanks, George Stephanopoulos, uh, who, as he pointed out, was somewhat isolated from the violence there, because as close as they'll let you broadcast at this point, uh, but you can still see the smoke uh, coming up. Um, it's felt all over the country. A number of newspapers around the country are now putting out special editions of the day. I remember when the Challenger exploded. We were on television for many, many, many hours, uh, and which does, to some extent, isolate you from uh, what is happening. You I'm a conveyor belt for information, going back to the hotel and realizing that the New York Times and the Washington Post had then put out 30 some odd page editions uh, in terms of the Challenger disaster, John, and it just, it just reminds you that you can be isolated from something that is so overwhelming, and, and George Stephanopoulos acknowledges he is not as close to the violence and tragedy. Like ABC's Bill Blakemore is somewhat closer. Um, Bill, can you hear me? Bill Blakemore? Okay, we'll come back to Bill Blakemore, but Bill Blakemore has, you know, we want to be as close as we can and not get in anybody's way, and I was pointing out that newspapers across the country publishing these, these special editions, 
Uh, there's not been a special edition of this magnitude probably since the Challenger exaster before that, Neil Armstrong walking in the moon, or in some cases, newspapers are putting out the first major special edition they've done since John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, many of the papers will clear, clearly use terror uh, in their banner headlines. Uh, certainly the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel was one that did that with, uh, with a subheading saying, Attacks Rip Trade Center, Pentagon, America's Soul. And I think a great many people in the country feel that is precisely what has happened today, that the, that the trade towers, as we've said many times, these, these absolute symbols of the United States in so many ways, right there on the edge of Manhattan, first city in the new world, um, the great advertisement to the rest of the world of commerce and success and outward mobility and all that stuff, and those two trade towers are simply no longer there. And then the attack on the Pentagon uh, at the very heart of the of the establishment, the, the military government establishment today, um, and the deep psychological damage that this, or wound, if not long-term damage, this is going to do to the country. And then we learned just a short while ago that that, that um, United Airlines jet that was carrying 45 people, which crashed near Johnstown in Pennsylvania today, was, at least according to one congressman, James Moran, Democrat from Virginia, who had had a Marine Corps briefing in Washington. He believes that that aircraft was intended, originally intending by its hijackers to go to Camp David, the presidential retreat in the mountains of Maryland. And the crash site actually turns out to be about 85 miles northwest of Camp David. So no one should be surprised, perhaps no one is, um, at, the, at the ripple effect um, at every level of government, not to mention in everybody's soul today, um, from this initial attack on the trade towers. Uh, one of our reporters, Ellen Davis, reports, by the way, from the American Red Cross in New York City. They've actually had so many volunteers for blood that about uh, 1,200 people showed up at the, at the blood donation center in New York City, and they actually have enough blood for now, except for people with type O and RH negative blood because they have a shortage of those, but in terms of every, in all other types of blood, they seem to be in pretty good shape. John Miller, what are you finding on the telephone? Uh, basically, still that uh, they are just beginning to try and mount a rescue operation in the Trade Center, um, that they are still trying to assess how many people are trapped inside, that they're still trying to collate the number of people that they removed um, to so many different hospitals in two states. Um, and, and, and now, because our burn centers here in New York, of which there are only three, have been overwhelmed uh, even in Canada. So um, they're really just beginning what's going to be an operation um, that's going to take uh, not days, but weeks, uh, more likely months. Let's go, thank you, John, let's go to ABC's Bill Blakemore, who I said is in lower Manhattan and closer even than George Stephanopoulos was able to get. Bill, do you hear me? I do, Peter. Go ahead. There's an enormous search and rescue operation being mounted here for what's clearly going to be many days of grim work. We're just north of the wreckage and the smoke still coming out on the West Side Highway, right next to the Hudson River. Hundreds of firemen are reassembling and restaging here after their first partial defeat this morning, and they know that many of their colleagues are missing with the civilians in the wreckage. I've talked to several of them who were in one of the towers when the other one was collapsing, who barely got out. They're not quite sure how and can't even begin to talk about it. Uh, uh, tables have been set up in the street here by some of the officers who are helping them figure out who's going to go in when they can. There's a triage center that's been set up in the Manhattan Community College uh, where bodies and people and survivors are going to be brought as they begin to figure out how badly they're injured. And we can tell because they still can't go in, they're still milling around in the hot sun here, that it's going to take a long time before they can even begin to assess how many people there are who need their help in search and rescue, which is uh, going to go on for some time. The streets just behind us uh, are quite different. Uh, there's almost an eerie war scene type of feeling because much of this uh, part of the West Village has emptied out. On this very clear hot day, there are occasionally jet fighters circling overhead, so there's even just a touch of the feeling of uh, covering a war. But for the most part, uh, everybody is still looking at this enormous wreckage and just beginning to absorb what it is, and these firemen are eager and ready to get in there as they begin to gather themselves and dust themselves off from, uh, from their first uh, foray in this morning. 
Bill, th this is an excellent report. I just have this one question, and it may just simply be my own inability to grasp it visually. Are they actually getting into either of the former towers of the Trade Center, or are they still working on the outside perimeter? Uh, I cannot tell you the exact answer to that. Uh, many of them are still waiting on the outside of the perimeter to figure out how to get into the general mm -hmm. area. When the North Tower collapsed, uh, parts of the top of it fell over all the way over here to the river. And so they're still trying to sort out through the smoke just exactly where they can get into. They are not letting the media get anywhere near the actual base um, of the two towers themselves. Uh, but there's just a general sense of these uh, accumulating hundreds of firemen, that they're, they're ready to go in. They're waiting to find where an opening will be. Okay, thanks very much, Bill Blakemore. ABC's Don Daler did manage to get, I think, pretty close to the building uh, at one point earlier today. Don, are you there? Yes, Peter, I'm here. I'm, I'm just back to uh, about four blocks away, but uh, I was, uh, I escorted a federal agent through the, uh, up to the site of the World Trade Center itself, and can tell you it, it is the, probably the most horrible thing I've ever seen in my life. There is total devastation, but beyond that, there, um, there's no non-gruesome way to describe this, but there were there are bodies and body parts um, on top of some buildings next to where the World Trade Center stood that in the streets. There is uh, still a number of fires going on in buildings surrounding it, including the Marriott. There is a, uh, the Marriott buildings appears to be, uh, be on fire. There's a building directly behind the federal office building. I can't identify which building it is, but it's a taller building. The police and the firemen are uh, are getting away from that area. They're afraid that that building will collapse as well. There have been a couple building collapses or portions of them collapsing from the flames. So there are some buildings that they are just letting burn uh, to collapse because it's too dangerous for them to fight it right now. Don, thanks very much, Don. And now here is the, uh, we're going to go to a briefing now on behalf of the, the political wing of the president's, I'm sorry. Just have a very brief statement. And I want Chief Jester to talk about the search and rescue efforts underway. No surprise, we have very, very few details. We'll tell you what we can at this stage, but we have very few details. Um, this is a terrible day. It is a tragic day for America. Our thoughts and prayers are with the injured and their families and the casualties. We're taking every appropriate step and precaution to prevent further attacks. We're making every effort to take care of the injured still in the building. And we're taking every appropriate measure to determine who is responsible. The Secretary of Defense. And at President Bush's direction, we are implementing it. We began to implement it immediately after the first attack in New York this morning. We contacted American forces and embassies throughout the world and placed them on high alert. The United States Secret Service immediately secured the President, the Vice President, and the Speaker of the House, and they are all safe. They have also secured members of the national security team, the president's cabinet, and senior staff. As you know, President Bush was in Sarasota, Florida when the first attack occurred this morning. Air Force One has now landed at Offutt Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska, and the president is in a secure location. He is in continuous communication with the vice president and key members of his cabinet and national security team. Vice President Cheney and our national security advisor Condoleezza Rice are in a secure facility at the White House. I have just come from there. The Secretary of Transportation and other members of our White House senior staff are gathered at a command center there and we are coordinating with other branches of our federal government. The Secretary of Defense remains at the Pentagon and the Secretary of State is en route back to Washington from his trip to South America. President Bush is conducting a meeting of the National Security Council as we speak. They are meeting President Bush from his location and other members from different locations in Washington and other locations. As many of you have been reporting, the Federal Aviation Administration ordered all airports closed and all planes which were in the air were directed to land at the nearest airport. International flights were diverted to alternate locations outside of the United States. Transportation Secretary Mineta 
has directed the Federal Aviation Administration to suspend operations until at least noon tomorrow. So no airline flights will operate until at least then and until the FAA announces that operations will be resumed. Secretary Mineta has also issued orders controlling the movement of all vessels in United States navigable waters. The Federal Emergency Management Agency has activated eight urban search and rescue task forces in New York and four of these highly trained teams are at work here in Washington at the Pentagon. Every federal agency has implemented continuity of operations plans to make sure the government continues to function effectively. While the markets closed today because of the situation in Manhattan, the United States financial system has continued to operate. Banks have been open all day. The Federal Reserve has operated regularly and continuously. The Department of Health and Human Services has mobilized medical personnel and supplies to provide help to local authorities who are working so diligently to respond and try to help the victims of these terrible attacks. President Bush has committed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to identify and bring to swift justice those responsible for these despicable attacks. The Department of Justice is setting up a hotline for families who fear that their relatives may have been victims of one of these attacks, and we will be announcing that telephone number shortly. Our fellow citizens and our freedom came under attack today, and no one should doubt America's resolve. President Bush and all our country's leaders thank the many Americans who are helping with rescue and relief efforts. We ask our fellow Americans for your prayers, for the victims, for their families, for the rescue workers, and for our country. Thank you all very much, and we will continue to update you as information is available and confirmed. Karen Hughes, Karen Hughes, the uh, uh, president. I, I must say, John Miller, that there's not an enormous amount of news in there if we've been following this th this event all day. No, even the White House seems to be having difficulty gleaning the facts, which officials in New York City just don't seem to know. Yeah. In terms of level of casualties, yeah. number of people killed. And, it, and it's enormously, enormous. We're going to go to the our White House correspondent, Claire Shipman, one of our White House correspondents, Claire Shipman, at the moment, uh, to see what's going on. But it's an, I, I'm very deeply sympathetic with the with the, uh, the difficulty it is to get down to street level, either at the Pentagon uh, or certainly in New York City, and understand the chaos and the tragedy that has appeared at ground level. Those of us sitting in newsrooms, um, bringing in, interpreting, analyzing information at a variety of levels, uh, are, are not doing a good enough job, because probably an impossible job to do, to try to, to have ourselves and you understand just um, what happened when that building fell in on each other. Listening to Bill Blakemore a short while ago and Don Daly are very helpful in terms of trying to understand it. But there is a, there is a delay in, in everything. There's a delay in government at the federal, state, and the national level. The airlines, of course, all across the country closed down. And it's, and it's true with news coverage as well, as best we can sense from here, that it's hard to get back from the immediate scene of this um, enough of a sort of texture to help us understand how what enormous this is. Maybe you don't need it, maybe you already appreciate that, but that's our sense uh, from here. But there's Karen Hughes uh, making, uh, the president has appeared, remember, uh, twice. Claire Shipman ready? Claire? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. I can. Oh, you, you better, you, but much better you than me bring us up to date on what's happening in the presidential establishment both there and elsewhere. Well, let me tell you what we know so far. You obviously just heard a statement from Karen Hughes that seemed designed to try to express to the country that the government is still up and running. Uh, the, the political advisors, as you've, you've mentioned a couple of times, would very much like to see the president get back to Washington when it's safe so that he can address the country. But in the meantime, they certainly want to give the impression that everything is under control, that the vice president is at the White House, Condoleezza Rice is at the White House, the Federal Reserve is still operating, banks are open, HHS 
is mobilized, and, and I think that was the point she is trying to get across. We've been told that the president may be back as early as this evening. The AP was also reporting he's considering some sort of address to the nation this evening, but again, it may be that he will want to have something very specific to be able to tell the public before that happens. Colin Powell, we're told, is on his way back from Peru. It's not clear where he will head. At this moment, what has happened in terms of the Secret Service is that their plan has gone into effect for this sort of emergency. The first time, we're told, that a plan like this has been implemented in, in recent history, of course. But what it means is they have all of their protectees accounted for. They're satisfied with that now. Now we're told they're in level two where they're assessing the threat. And they will then decide things, for example, as to whether Colin Powell can go back and safely work at the State Department and whether the president can come back to Washington. In the meantime, as you probably know, there's been a state of emergency declared in the city of Washington and in the state of Virginia, allowing both of those places to be able to mobilize um, military and police forces a as needed, Peter. Thanks very much, uh, Claire Shipman from Washington. It is a, it's very difficult to keep your hands on the political establishment today, in part because we rely on government uh, so often in cases like this to tell us what is going on in their various departments and it has been very difficult today to uh, get, the, for example, the uh, Federal Emergency Management Administration uh, got involved I in this today, but it's hard because of the communications problems all across the country to have a real appreciation of what they are participating. The most direct uh, communication we've had has been with, uh, with New York City on the ground, that is other than in terms of uh, the President's movements from Florida to Louisiana and now on to Nebraska where he is going to stay for the indefinite future, though political, political staff keep saying he'd really like to come back to Washington. There is something interesting in the laundry list of, of things that Karen Hughes, counselor to the president, said in the briefing we just looked at, which is um, one is that uh, airspace will remain uh, shut down under government control until noon tomorrow and that the movements of ships uh, around the coast will be regulated by the government. That suggests, um, I mean, we're talking about not a few hours, we're talking about uh, halfway into the next day. That suggests that there's a real feeling in the intelligence community and, and in Washington that this may not be over, that they don't want to let go of, of the assets like air traffic that they think um, could unleash even more attacks. I, I wonder, John, if there is a real feeling in the intelligence community that may not be over or God, we didn't know any of this was going on. Maybe there's something else there that we don't have the vaguest idea Precisely. about. Precisely. I mean, it seems to be an abundance of caution um, and some degree of fear. Okay. Now, we're joined by ABC's Betsy Stark, who covers business and economics for us. I, uh, you add to this extraordinary notion of how much the national life has been interrupted today by an act of, or several, act, two acts of terrorism. Anyway, um, start first with who's what businesses were in the World Trade Center we've talked to people before about the number of people in the Trade Center yeah and what else has happened Peter it's astounding um, how much the Twin Towers are part of the of the life of the financial district 10 percent of all the office space in lower Manhattan is accounted for in those Twin Towers 155 businesses 50,000 workers as you've said before uh, including some of the the, the major uh, financial firms Morgan Stanley Stanley, the investment bank, uh, has uh, 50 floors in, uh, in Tower One. 12, 50? 50 floors, I believe is right. 12.5% of the space in that tower uh, occupied by Morgan Stanley. Several, the, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, uh, which mm. manage bridges and tunnels, the airports, the harbor, uh, a major tenant, 9% of the space there. Several major insurance firms, Empire Blue Cross, Marsh and McLennan, and uh, among the banks, uh, Deutsche Bank, Bank of America, a uh, couple of big trading firms, Credit Suisse First Boston, and uh, Oppenheimer Funds, which uh, is a firm that uh, manages several mutual funds. So uh, lots, of, uh, lots of the big names on Wall Street were in those uh, twin towers. And in terms, the markets were closed today. The markets were closed. Stock uh, markets. Stock markets uh, throughout the country. Uh, trading was halted in some of the foreign markets. The, the, uh... We interrupt ABC News with this local 4 o'clock news update as you take a live look at the Pentagon six hours after what uh, law enforcement sources say was a Boeing 757 American Airlines flight that crashed into this symbol of U.S. military might. You're looking... 
Sorry, Kathleen. Uh, that was a scene from earlier today. Uh, nearly an hour ago, uh, rescue people were rescue personnel were still trying to get people out of the building. Uh, flames were still coming out, and um, we understand that uh, this has gone to three alarm blaze, and that fire officials from all over the Washington region have been called in to help fight the blaze. There are people still inside. Uh, and uh, rescue attempts are still being made to get some of those people out. Now, patients have been taken to hospitals throughout the area. Not only has there been tremendous building carnage, but human cost as well. And we want to bring you up to date on where some of those folks have been taken. First of all, Virginia Hospital Center is reporting they've received 30 injured from the Pentagon. Washington Hospital Center, five critical injuries. George Washington Hospital, two are now in the emergency room. And Alexandria Inova Hospital reports that they have received five patients in fair condition, one in critical, one in good. And again, as Maureen said, uh, these uh, numbers continue to mount as the afternoon progresses. We also have some more information uh, from uh, Paris Glendening in Maryland. The governor says that the head of the state police in Maryland got a list of 11 sites across the country that were apparent targets of these terrorism attacks. Two of those sites were in uh, Maryland, the Baltimore World Trade Center, and the state capitol in Annapolis. Of course, uh, those sites have not been hit, but we're just sharing that information with you. Also, Congressman uh, James Moran in uh, uh, Virginia says he received information today that that plane that crashed in Pennsylvania, here's some uh, video of that, site may have been headed for the presidential retreat at Camp David. Apparently, uh, Mr. Moran says that apparently this hijacked plane went down in western Pennsylvania. It was meant to crash at Camp David, which of course is the presidential retreat. Now, to understand the magnitude of this, you have to imagine something like the Oklahoma City uh, bombing, where you had a major federal building, such as the Pentagon, combined with a 757 airplane crash. That conveys the magnitude of what we're confronting here in the nation's capital. We'll continue to break in at about uh, 4 30. We'll be back with more news. And meanwhile, we want to join ABC News in progress. Casualties uh, were like, um, and he said, more than anyone can bear, more than anyone can bear. And I think that's the clear casualty. Uh, the dead and the wounded people that we are going to uh, we're going to uh, we're going to have today but as Betsy has just uh, made clear in terms of business and in human beings including I had no idea that Morgan Stanley had 50 stories of the World Trade Center um, these statistics you see that we put up on television from time to time are the just the sort of bare cold background uh, to life <coughs> and death stories which have taken place today but the impact of this has gone so far beyond New York City. And, and just as you, as you look at, that's a live shot of New York City now, a live picture of, of what's happening down inside that dreadful little rectangle of violence which is hidden behind the glamour and success stories of the buildings to the right and to the left. The Federal Avi Aviation Administration, as you know, we shot all airports nationwide. The Greyhound bus service canceled all of its, or the Greyhound bus company canceled all of its services in the Northeast. Um, Amtrak, the, the railroad, uh, temporarily suspended train service all along the Northeast corridor between Boston and Washington. And the U.S. section of the St. Lawrence Seaway, which is between northern New York State for the most part <coughs> and Ontario, between the U.S. and the Canadian borders there, has been closed. Uh, the tunnels between Detroit and Windsor on the Canadian side of the Detroit River closed to car traffic. Um, and security just went bang up several levels at all U.S.-Canadian border crossings in large measure because there has been a penetration across the U.S.-Canadian border before. Um, one of the ones they caught when an alert agent, as we've said several times today, picked up a guy on his way where he thought to bomb the Seattle Space Needle. Turned out he was really interested in setting off a bomb inside Los Angeles International Airport. The space shuttle operations were halted today. 12,000 employees of the Kennedy Space Center in Florida were actually sent home. And at the Naval Weapons Station in Goose Creek, South Carolina, workers were evacuated and sent there. Again, evacuations and people being sent home from the very heart uh, of the military establishment. Betsy Stark has just told us that all U.S. financial markets were closed. United Nations building was evacuated here in New York City. Uh, General Motors, General Motors in Detroit gave all 6,000 employees who work in the Renaissance Center 
one of those centers built to try to rejuvenate downtown Detroit, were all told to go home today. And the Ford Motor Company closed its world headquarters in Dearborn in Michigan. The IRS in various places closed. The popular skyscrapers uh, were closed and or evacuated in, in, all, in, in, in cities uh, all across the country. I think you probably already heard us say, if you've been with us for much today, that the New York primary election uh, was canceled here in New York, and Governor Pataki said they'll simply reschedule it when they get another handle on normal life uh, in, in, in the days ahead. And tourist attractions, I have a list of tourist attractions. Knott's Berry Farm in California, the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles, and the Library Tower in Los Angeles, the Liberty Bell Independence Hall, the Space Needle, Walt Disney World, they all closed down today. What, what better way, even though it's just a list of things, or it is a list of things, an understanding that both at home and overseas, embassies at overseas were evacuated, embassies were closed. Tony Blair, the British Prime Minister, forbid civilian aircraft from flying around London. So these two attacks on the Trade Tower and the one in the Pentagon and the, and the possibility of, uh, uh, of an attack on Camp David, we now believe, in the aircraft that crashed not far from Johnstown in Pennsylvania, all just phew, had this extraordinary impact all over the world because people feared something else was going to happen and may still fear that something else is going to happen. Listen, just listen to some of what has happened today. I saw something hit the second tower, and when I saw that, it just was, everything rumbled, and I saw all this fire just shoot out in the sky, and stuff started just falling like, like it was raining, and I, I was by myself, and I just ran. I started seeing people uh, just... Uh, they started jumping out of the window, like at the 96th floor, they just started... Uh, one at a time from different parts of the building. I just started seeing people just drop, drop, and drop. I saw a man walking up the block and I asked him, he was just covered in soot. And my first question was, did they get a lot of people out? And the look in his eye, he just shook his head. I mean, he was in a daze. We lost all visibility and we assisted people getting out. It was very difficult to get out of where, uh, the police desk area. Um, and then I went back in and we were, we were carrying an injured person out, myself and about four firemen. And um, unfortunately, that's when the building two collapsed. I happened to dive underneath the ESU uh, vehicle, and I'm not sure what happened to the firemen. The I was, I was, I was, um, I was trapped for about 15 minutes under the truck. It just rained building, okay? And and I was buried alive for 15 minutes until I scrambled out. We're just putting a microphone on a young man who's joined me here in our newsroom in New York uh, named Kevin Sudovy, who is a young publisher. And take that visitor sign probably off your, off your shirt as well. Um, and I don't know much about you except that you're a publisher and you have been shooting some video today which you have brought with you. Can you give me a sense of what it is? Well, when you see it, I mean, basically I was right, right there. I went there. I, somebody called me up. I was in Brooklyn. And uh, my photographer last night shot it, and I, I wanted to see if she was, I tried to call her, but all the phones were jammed. So I went to Manhattan to see her, and then I went straight to the, um, to the site, and they weren't letting me, anybody in, but I had a motorcycle, so I went straight in. And I kept going through all the levels of security, and I just went around, and then next thing I knew, I was like, standing right there, like where everybody, the fire people, everybody just, everybody just sitting there, like they didn't, there's nothing they can do. You're talking about point. the Trade Tower, are you? Yeah, and, 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 and somebody was photographing at the Trade Tower last night? Yeah, I had, she shot the last, probably the last photo ever shot at the Twi Trade Center. Okay, let's have a look at what you have, and do you mind uh, just taking us this through it as we watch it on the air? How much, how much video is there here, do you know? That's the, uh, that's the, um, all that's standing at the Twin Towers right now in the background, that's all that's standing. That's it, that's all that's left. So you're literally right inside, um... What time did you actually photograph? I don't even know. That, that was actually I rode my motorcycle right up from there. That was like about that was about an hour ago, not even. 
And this is right at the center of where the trade right, towers right stood. You can until. see, like, when you see the firemen, they just, there's nothing they can do. It's just like... You must have been frightened at the very least to be there. Uh, I mean, I was just, I was just thinking to myself how, what a powerful uh, act of ignorance it was, really. I'm just amazing. And this is the building I adjacent to... That's the Twin Towers, right? That right. was the Twin Tower. That was the other tower. That's the... And then we went up into more into there. You know, I, re I just thought to myself, I can smell it, but in fact, yeah, what I can do is smell your yeah. shirt. Yeah. You brought the smell of just that disaster with you on your T-shirt. Were there other people in there? There's any? I don't see any any uh, anybody sort of. You know, no, I was with one, I was with one other person I ran into there who actually somebody I know, and he was t photographing as well. And that was just us two and the firemen. It's funny, I ran into my friend right there who's also taking pictures. It should be somewhere. They probably edited him out. It's absolutely... Look at that. That's all that's left. That's, that's Do you know whether it. that's the South Tower or the North Tower? That's the South Tower. And you saw no sign of life in here no, whatsoever? No, I went, I went all the way right there. Like, I don't know if they edited it out yet, but there's a big <coughs> hole going down to the ground. There's nobody. And then we ran into somebody else because we haven't seen anybody. Nobody. But the fireman said, you know, that there's been a lot of people dead, like a lot of firemen died. Because there were firemen in the building at the time trying to help people evacuate from the building. Yeah, they said two, 200 people died. I thought the firemen I saw too said 200 people died already. And this this wall here, this is from part of the tower yeah, itself? Yeah, that's the south tower, the, the, the lobby. And it's all the smoke and there's still fire going on in there right now. Are you walking across? Yeah, see, you, that's you're walking that's across, and that's your yeah. friend yeah. also with a, yeah. with a photograph. And the yeah. building on the right that occasionally appears in, 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 is fire. in a building adjacent? Yeah, and it's just gouged. Like, the parts of the Twin Tower just gouged out the building. It's, see, that's the this concourse below. That's going down like 20 feet or so. But that's, that's the part that's crazy. It's just that's all that's left. Did you hear anything while you were in there? Just like crackling and pops and stuff. See, that's, that's the guy who's been looking for his friends, and he didn't find anybody either. And do we know who this person is? No, he, he was speaking uh, Russian. Really? Looking through the, through the devastation. And this now is what? This is a party, actually. So. Last night? No, it's a while ago. But. Mm. Well, where was the party? In? Uh, that was in uh, PS1. Oh, so, so you just simply decided to go in there to see what you could what you could photograph. Yeah, I wanted it because I. It's funny because the name of my magazine is Prophecy, and we had just shot the Twin Towers last night. My photographer Amy had just been shooting it with a four x five fo uh, format last night, and I hadn't spoken to her yet. And then my friend called me this morning and said, "Did you hear what happened?" And I said, "No." And then, so I went to like I said, I went to the city to see Amy because I couldn't reach her. All the phones were down. And so I went to, uh, I went right to, uh, to the site. Were you, were you doing a feature on the Twin Towers, were you? Well, basically, I was photographing the Twin Towers for, for the power of the Twin Towers, architecturally and, like, metaphorically, what they stood for. And then, you know, these people, you know, wanted to destroy them. I was kind of, you know, I was, I was observing them more. We have been shooting it for over a week. Really? And it's ended in this vulnerable place? Yeah. yeah. Uh, can I just get one other thing clear? You managed to get right onto the site itself, right onto the top of, of, of one of the two towers. Right. But I couldn't see any police. I couldn't see any fire department. Well, they were all back there. We went. I went right into it. They were all, like, just around it. Did you have any sense when you were walking on it that it was too dangerous to be on? No. Well, you know, there was a, when, we, when we first started walking in, the fire people were like, no, don't go. But we just went in. And you we never wanted heard, to see. And you never heard a sound except the sound of Yeah, there was no fire people, cracking. there was no nothing. There was just glass breaking and stuff like that. Hmm. Well, Kevin, thank you for this. Kevin Sudavi, he's a publisher of a magazine called Prophecy. And he, thanks very much, Kevin, for coming. Anything else Welcome. you can think of, just... I mean, I just wanted to say, I think that's a powerful act of, of ignorance at the end of the day, because this country is so full with so many different types of people. And I, I can understand, um, you know, people and their frustrations with capitalism and, and other, just capitalism. I can understand people's frustration. 
but to, to, to do that type of destruction to people they don't even know, it's just, like I said, it's powerful. I understand they're trying to make, get a message across, but it's also powerfully ignorant, in my opinion. That's all I can say. That's all no, I want to say. I think, it's a thing that, I, think, I think it's a thing that many people in the country agree with today. Uh, that it was an act of terror and an act of ignorance and, and which the government has said repeatedly today it'll try to get to the bottom of, but nobody's very hopeful about I that. I mean, it's obvious that, the, that there needs to be a better dialogue between, you know, these people and what they need done and what, what we're doing. And uh, that they're bringing the, uh, the field to a whole nother level. But, um, I, like I said, I understand to an extent, but it needs to go further than I think than what they're doing. Well, we're grateful as a news organization that you decided to bring that video in here. Thanks very much, Kevin Sudeby, because it gives us the closest, the most intimate sense we have seen yet of what it is like at ground zero in terms of the building collapsing in on itself. And I think that George Stephanopoulos can add to the status of the building and also, George, to the current police activity. I must, weren't you a bit surprised to see nobody in there besides young Mr. Sudovy? Nobody at all. It really was surprising, although it did accord with what we'd heard earlier, Peter, and now we've just heard from our, one of our reporters, Lucy Kerrigan, who's gotten quite close, that the police are actually pulling back from the scene right now. The police and other rescue personnel are pulling right. back from the scene because they're concerned about two things. Number one, all of the asbestos in the air coming out from that smoke from the collapsing building and secondly the possibility of other buildings collapsing in the area so they've actually pulled away now um, from ground zero if you will secondly peter another another grim note um, we have now heard that chelsea piers which is a large several block long athletic complex over here on the west side at 17th street and 11th avenue has now been turned into an, a temporary hospital and morgue here in manhattan it's the first temporary hospital and morgue that's been set up there are now 30 ambulances operating out of there and that will be one of the major sites here on the uh, lower west side thanks very much george actually we're now looking at some more footage that kevin sotheby's taking kevin just tell us where this is what is this this is on the, uh, on the west end highway and um, I can't remember the other street. You can't tell, this. you really can't tell, but it's right there where the South Tower was, where the Marriott was. The Marriott Hotel, yeah. the Marriott uh, Hotel headquarters there, and, and you're, you're still focused very much on the, on the Trade Towers itself, aren't yeah. you? Yeah, and on the rubble, it's just amazing. It's, the cars, the ambulances are all crushed, lights are still going, horns are still being, you know, are still blowing. Is there, is there, a, did you pick up there was some sense of activity here, that there was some sense of purpose, or just people overwhelmed by what had happened? You mean the uh, fire department? Fire department, the police, the There was nothing the they could do. They, were, they said that there were already 200 firemen dead. They were just, you know, it was futile. It's, it's sort of, it's bigger than there, there's not enough people. There's just a handful of people there. Because so many firemen were working to get other people out when I mean, this actually not, happened. Yeah. I mean, you need an army of people to, to... And, of course, the city will have an army of people before long because the National Guard is coming in. Uh, it's very interesting what the, the mayor said some time ago. He said people need relief, desperately want relief. At the same time, they don't want relief because they don't want to leave the job they are doing uh, because, in many cases, they are uh, looking for and or supporting their friends and the colleagues. And, and that's a, a bit of a review there of some of the material that, that uh, Kevin Sotheby shot uh, earlier, and which we're very glad to have. Um, I'm just looking at, at one more report from our foreign desk here this morning, that a KAL plane, Chuck Lustig, a KAL plane, KAL, you mean the Korean, Korean Airlines plane? Thanks very much. A Korean Airlines plane was forced down by U.S. and Canadian forces over White Horse Bay in Canada earlier today. The Canadian television reports that forces on the ground stormed the plane, and we have no other details at this time. But there's another <coughs> aberrant incident uh, today happening in, in Canada. U.S. military throughout the world, uh, we've said before, are on the highest state of alert. So from what's, what's, what's spread out from here um, has just been quite extraordinary in terms of putting everybody in the world most U.S. military forces on threat condition Delta, which is the highest uh, condition uh, that the military, the highest alert the military can be on. 
Um, but as, as any number of people have reported today, any notion that the U.S. was invincible died in this, uh, in, in this rubble. Um, listening, to some of the, listening to some of the politicians talk today, Senator Chuck Hagel of Nebraska, where the president is at the moment, uh, said America is forever changed and America is in for a long fight which I think people in the in the in the fight against uh, terrorism understand and have understood for a very long time but somebody else said this is a huge wake-up call for the United States both former Secretary of State Baker and I think the former director of the CIA said that uh, that there was there was just not enough human intelligence on behalf of the United States in these organizations and cells around the world John McCrethy our Pentagon correspondent has just come from a Pentagon briefing and um, so we'll pick you up, John. John, yeah, what are you hearing? Uh, Peter, one of the things they wanted to do and do very publicly is to deal with the rumor that had been circulating for several hours that uh, the fourth civilian jetliner that was hijacked was shot down by American uh, aircraft. They are denying that flatly. They say it is absolutely not true, Peter. John, I apologize. I was distracted. And so for the benefit of anybody else who was distracted, I mean, do you mind repeating that? I'm sorry. They are denying the rumor that had been circulating for several hours that the U.S. military shot down one of the civilian jetliners. They're saying that is absolutely oh. not true. Okay, thank you, John. You caught me off balance because, in fact, I'd never heard the rumor in the first place and not heard, uh, and not heard the report whatsoever. Now, you've been in a briefing. What else did you hear? Um, well, they're not saying a whole heck of a lot. What they are saying is that they now have accounted for the presence uh, of all of the Joint Chiefs, the service secretaries, uh, and of course the Secretary of Defense. Those are people who have been accounted for. Um, what we are now learning is that um, a new part of the Pentagon that uh, is, has just been occupied was one of the areas that was terribly hit. Uh, we believe there are going to be quite a few casualties from the Army, the Navy, and the Marine Corps in particular, uh, as well as the Defense Intelligence Agency. Do you have any, under, any idea what the num quite a number of casualties means? Uh, no idea whatsoever, Peter. Uh, you consider the density uh, in the Pentagon. There are 20 to 24,000 people that work there. Uh, it took out one huge slice of it. Uh, so you have to do your own arithmetic. Uh, if you look at the size of the gash over my shoulder, uh, you have to believe that there are many, many hundreds of people who died. And what have the briefers had to say this afternoon, John, about the state of alert in the, uh, in the world generally, with all U.S. forces on such a state of alert? I'm sorry, before you go to that, we're just looking at a picture which gives us, I think, the best view yet, if this is an accurate drawing, um, of... of of what the degree of damage or penetration of the plane will have been to the Pentagon. I'm not sure that's absolutely accurate, but by the way, ABC's Ann Compton tells us the president may be on the move again, and ABC's Charlie Gibson has information as well. Charlie? Well, Peter, there's going to be hundreds, I guess, and we don't know the number of personal stories that are going to come out of this, people who have died in the World Trade Center or at the Pentagon or on the airplanes that were hijacked and crashed in various places. We now understand the wife of Ted Olson. He is the Solicitor General of the United States. Mm. America came to know him because he's the man who argued the President's case in front of the Supreme Court, George W. Bush's case in front of the Supreme Court. He was not yet President when the case of the Florida election was being disputed before the Supreme Court. Ted Olson's wife, Barbara, who is a former federal prosecutor herself. She was on the plane that crashed into the Pentagon. We had heard this from friends of the family. Regrettably, it has now been confirmed. She apparently was able to make a phone call to her husband, the Solicitor General, Ted mm -hmm. Olson, and tell him they were being hijacked, that all of those on board the plane, that is American Airlines Flight 77, that had taken off from Dulles Airport heading for Los Angeles this morning, a 757, uh, that had 64 people aboard. All of the passengers had been herded into the back of the plane. Uh, she was able to get a call out saying they were in the process of being hijacked, and then shortly after that, uh, the plane crashed into the Pentagon. Uh, she was herself, as I say, a former federal prosecutor. She had also become familiar, I think, to many uh, in the viewing audience of television as a commentator recently over the situation of Gary Condit. Indeed, I'd had a chance uh, to talk with her a couple of times on Good Morning America 
just in the past couple of weeks. So we're going to hear hundreds of these stories of people who were killed in, in the various venues that were affected today, but uh, this one obviously is very painful, the wife of the Solicitor General of the United States. Peter. Thanks very much, Charlie. Uh, and I, I think in the whole day, this is the first name we've had of anybody who's died. The first name, the first personality, I mean, to hundreds and thousands of families around the country. The names and personalities are all from many familiar people they fear are in trouble, who know they're in trouble, who've been confirmed they're in trouble. The desperation of people at some remote, at, at a distance from people in trouble is just a horrendous thing to report. But I believe that's the first name we've had all day of uh, being able to identify somebody, Barbara Olson, who, as Charlie says, was very often on television, the wife of the Solicitor General, Ted Olson, uh, who died in the suicide attack on the Pentagon. John McCrethy, you still there? It's Peter. Yeah. John, come back to the briefing, if you would. I'm, I'm not sure we've heard everything from you on the briefing itself. Uh, they just are expressing their frustration and at the difficulty of getting rescue workers inside the Pentagon, Peter. Uh, part of the building is still on fire, uh, and the fire is moving to sections of the Pentagon uh, along roofs and along various pipes. Uh, so they're having a real difficulty getting in there even to search for bodies at this early time. That is what they are focused on at this point. I will tell you, Peter, that Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, and most of the chiefs uh, have been in the National Military Command Center all day uh, since this terrorist strike. Uh, and you have to leave it up to your own imagination, the kinds of things that they are contemplating uh, in their hours uh, after the strike. Okay, John, thank you very much indeed. John McCrethy, who's been at the Pentagon all day and was in the other side of the Pentagon <clears throat> when this aircraft was crashed into the Pentagon today. We now know with all of the passengers on board, at least in this one phone call, herded to the back of the plane. Uh, who went from being passengers to hostages in a, in, in a matter of, of seconds and minutes. Um, and John, who was working on the other side of the Pentagon, has said a couple of times that just on the other side of the Pentagon, you just felt this huge, just knew exactly that something had gone by. And when he first described the, the width of the gash and the height of the gash, six stories high, 200 feet wide, uh, which you can't appreciate on television, quite frankly, as much as you think you can. And, and we've had several reports in from Martha Raddatz at the State Department, um, which I think most of, the, most of them we've had on the air so far, which was the State Department ordered U.S. embassies around the world to close for the day, but it's up to the individual embassy, given, on the, given the situation that they think uh, is appropriate in their region. Many have closed for the day. Uh, Secretary of State Powell, who's been in Colombia, uh, is on his way home tonight, but we do not know actually where he is at, at the moment. I told you just a moment ago that Ann Compton, who's been with President Bush all day, uh, believes that he is on the move, or they are on the move again, and one can only believe, I shouldn't say that, one can only didn't think they were going to go to Nebraska. We can only imagine that there's this pressure to get the President back to the nation's capital. And um, the State Department was evacuated at the time. Uh, this world, there's actually been a worldwide caution about terrorist activity out and about uh, universally uh, since the 7th of September, but it had absolutely nothing, nothing whatsoever to do uh, with what happened in New York City and in Washington today and what potentially happened, we we're told, at Camp David based on the information from one passenger who called 911 from the United Airlines that crashed near Johnstown, which said that they were headed in the direction of of, of Camp David. The New York Stock Exchange and the American Stock Exchange have both announced that they will not trade tomorrow and they will make a decision tomorrow on when trading will resume. The country has, in many ways, come to a halt, not completely by any means, because every politician has spoken and had a chance to speak today has made the point that if you, if you change too much in the country, you're doing exactly what the terrorists and their allies would like you to do. Linda Douglas on Capitol Hill. Linda. Good afternoon. This is Maureen Bunyan with Dell Walters at ABC7. We are showing you a live picture of the fire, which is still going on at the Pentagon this afternoon. Uh, this is in the wake of this terrible, terrible terrorist incident uh, early this morning. Uh, so far, there have not been uh, accounts of all the personnel in the Pentagon. Rescue efforts of those who are injured and in that building 
uh, still going on, as you can see. And uh, just a little while ago, there was a briefing outside the Pentagon about the situation there. Let's uh, show you what, uh, what the Pentagon officials had to say. Uh, right now, they're still working on the fire. We have smoke throughout the, the uh, building. We're fortunate in this part of the building in that the part of the, where the plane hit, one part of it was just beginning to be occupied. The areas had just been renovated. So part of it was occupied, but not all of it. As I just told you, the Navy and the Marine Corps say that not everyone in the Pentagon has been accounted for so far. If you work in the Pentagon, they want you to call this toll-free number. That's for both civilian and military workers. Please call this number, 1-877-663-6772, and let the Pentagon officials know that you are all right and accounted for. Dell And Maureen, uh, we just received the special late edition of the Washington Post. The headline reads, Terror Hits Pentagon World Trade Center. Uh, we'll get a shot of it on camera three here. But uh, that is the way that it is officially being recorded, history being recorded as of this day. Undoubtedly, this is one of those days where people will say, I was standing at such and such a place when it happened. We want to bring you up to date also on the number of injuries that are taking place. We have some graphics that we'll bring up on the screen. We are receiving reports that 31 injured parties have been taken to Virginia Hospital Center. Another five people are listed in critical condition at the Washington Hospital Center. George Washington Hospital has two people still in the emergency room at this point. Alexandria Anova Hospital, we are being told, has 10 people there. Uh, actually, we are being told that is 14 people, 10 of them in fair condition, one in critical condition, and three in stable. Perhaps if there is any bright side to all of this so far, and I repeat, it is early, but so far we have received no word of any fatalities yet. Yeah, thank you. We uh, go back to ABC News with Peter Jennings right now, of course, but uh, we'll have more for you on ABC 7 News at 5 o'clock this evening. Taken out of the city to a secret location. They had just been moved down the street. Yes, that's right. We have been told that they were taken out of the city. Helicopters came and picked them up on the ground, some of them. We don't know which ones got into the helicopters because it was just too far away for us to see and took them out of, uh, out of uh, Washington. But okay. it could be to some place very close. Thanks very much, Linda Douglas. Going to go to Lynn Sher and talk about the aircraft involved today in just a minute. Before we do, just want to give you some other examples of how this has affected the country as a whole. The Emmys, uh, which were going to be held in Los Angeles, the Latin Grammys, which were scheduled uh, uh, their award ceremonies uh, for tomorrow night, I think the Latin Grammys, uh, have now canceled or postponed their particular celebrations. We told you earlier or about some of the other examples, but uh, aside from looking at that list on the screen itself, think of this. Aside from the work stoppages, this is the first time, this is the first time since D-Day in 1944 that organized baseball has wiped out a whole day of regular season play. First time since D-Day in, in 1944. The landing of the Allied forces on the beaches at Normandy, which led ultimately to the liberation of Europe um, from the Germans. It's the first time since 1944 that organized baseball has done that. And there were all of the television shows in New York City, which <coughs> David Letterman show the, and, and others on CBS, which all get um, television audiences, popular audiences coming from around the country. They've all canceled their if their tapings. They'll be out there in reruns uh, tonight. This is true of the late night show on, on NBC. Um, malls across the country, malls across, you, you, some of you who live out around about the country, you all know this better than we do, but malls around the country uh, simply locked their doors and people couldn't go and shop in the malls today. It was this feeling that anywhere there were people gathered, uh, that there was a measure of vulnerability which we had seen uh, in New York City. <clears throat> now the mayor of New York City, Rudolph Giuliani, says at the moment, that at least 2,100 people have been injured and 600 of them taken to hospitals and that there are 1,500 walking wounded who have been taken to uh, Liberty State Park, which is on the other side of the New York Harbor there, uh, where the Hudson River meets the harbor. It, it may be live, but I'm not quite sure what you're looking at. Is this from the New Jersey side? This is from Liberty State Park uh, looking I assume across the New York Harbor uh, at an earlier 
point today because the smoke is not as thick now as it was. That's live. That's a live photograph, and that is that dark smoke is still coming from the trade tower itself. Thank you. Um, as for the attack on the Pentagon, the Virginia Hospital Center in Arlington, Virginia, reports uh, there have been as many 31 people injured there and admitted to the hospital, including two who are in surgery. <coughs> And, and most other patients are in intensive care, are in, in intensive care, or are being treated for smoke uh, immolation. I'm joined by Tom Humphreys, but I don't know much more about you, Peter? Mr. Humphreys, than that. You were in the World Trade Center on the 57th floor. Yes. And you walked out. Yes. So take us from the beginning, would you? Well, I was sitting at my desk working on a uh, speech I was supposed to give this afternoon, and you. the building was rocked by an explosion and which tower were you in? I was in tower one right and the next thing I knew I saw flaming debris uh, cascading down uh, the side of the building and um, I was in the 93 bombing right and I knew this one was a, was a lot worse so uh, we went out on the floor and you basically worked for a business in the building uh, I worked for a law firm in the building right. yeah. and basically Went on the floor, uh, tried to figure out what was going on, uh, figure out whether we should evacuate or not. Uh, about five minutes into that, we decided that it was best to get out. You were in the south. You were in the south tower. Uh, we were in the north. Oh, tower. Sorry, in the north tower. North tower, which is one world <clears throat> trade. Right. Uh, decided that it was time to get out. Our office manager heard that the plane had been uh, that the building had been hit by an aircraft at the 90th floor, so we assumed that that the problem was above us and uh, that we could evacuate, and that's what folks did. Did you think at the moment that it was a terrorist attack? Did you think it was I an had, accident? Did you have the biggest I, idea? I had hmm. some idea there was a bombing. Having been in the uh, 93 uh, incident, that kind of explosion just doesn't happen normally. I didn't know what it was, um, but uh, when I heard there was a plane that hit, hmm. I thought that made some sense, and, and I thought that it was very unlikely that, a, that any kind of plane would hit the Trade Center uh, accidentally. Mm. you know, on a clear day. So, uh, was there, uh, how, uh, how immediate, how deep was the concern in your colleagues and, and out on the common halls? It, was there panic at all? No, that's the, the one thing what, what, what I found is, is no panic. Uh, people are concerned. People are a little apprehensive uh, and they want to know what to do. Um, but uh, both on the floor and then uh, down the stairwell, there's no panic. And in fact, people were helping other people uh, to an mm. incredible degree. Were the stairwells lighted? Yes, this time they were. Last time they weren't. Th this time the stairwells were lighted. There was some smoke, but that was, uh, it wasn't nearly as bad. Was there emergency lighting? Uh, yeah, there was. Um, there was no other, you know, there were no fire police personnel. Uh, at that point, you're on your own. Now, you came and down from the 57th floor. Were yes. other people coming down from the floors above yeah, you and below you? Yeah, they were coming you? down uh, <clears throat> from the floors above. There were some injured people that came down, apparently, from you know, floors where this had happened. And so uh, we saw them as well. And how long did it take you to get out of the building? You know, I, I estimate it took me 45 minutes uh, or more to get out of the building. And, and in the time that you were coming down, there was another aircraft hit the southern. Yeah, tower. I was on the 44th floor trying to get down, and, and we heard another you know, explosion. We didn't know what it was. We again saw flaming debris, and uh, uh, I now know that that's you know that was the second aircraft that hit. I think so. you maybe know where I'm going. You were on the you were on the 90th floor. It took you 45 minutes. 57. 57 floor. floor. There were people coming down from floors above you. Right. Is it your sense that in at least your tower, before the tower collapsed, everybody or a large number of percentage of people managed to be evacuated? I, th I think a lot of people got out. First of all, it was 8:45 uh, in the morning, so that's relatively mm -hmm. early by New York standards right. uh, and then secondly the the first uh, plane that hit uh, there seemed to th there was time to get out uh, I think even having said that there were a lot of people still in that building including the fire and police personnel that right. were trying to come up so but but my sense is that uh, I know on our floor a lot of people got out and as you came down were you joined by people in other floors is it a common yeah. evacuation yeah. passage it's, down it, through it, the well, building? well the problem was there was only one stairwell open uh, the other the other stairwells were blocked by smoke and so you had one narrow stairwell, which is what led to the delay in the evacuation. And that's, you know, that's why it took so long to get out. We've told people in the rest of the country, uh, fairly regularly, the 50,000 people who work in the two trade centers. Yeah. And you say 8.45 in the morning is a little late for New York City. Is, do you, well, do you it's have a little any, early. A little, sorry, a little early. Yeah. Uh, do, you have, do you have a feeling that 
a lot of people hadn't gone into the building at this point? Uh, I know in our offices, uh, you know, we're a law firm, we started at 9.30, and, and a lot of people were not there yet. Uh, some of the businesses which operate on an earlier schedule, I'm sure everybody was there. Right. Um, but uh, I think that uh, the, the building wasn't as full as it could have been. If, if it had been two hours later, yeah. uh, it would have been much worse. And did, did you notice uh, today as you went to work or as you came out that it was more sparsely populated? Uh, it, it was about the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, uh, it was about a normal day. I, I must confess I'm amazed at how calm you are, having been through not only the 1993 bombing, but this, and walked down by yourself, and you seem perfectly calm. Well, I'm happy to be here. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. and, 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 and how did people behave as you were evacuating? People, I mean, that, that was, it, it, I saw it again eight years ago, and I saw it today. People were incredibly calm, and they were helping other people. I fear that some of the people that were helping other people didn't make it out of that building uh, because, you know, they stayed behind and uh, fire personnel. Uh, so, but, but people, there was no panic that I saw. And in that environment, you have a narrow stairwell, a lot of people, you don't know what's going on. It's, it's a recipe for disaster and the people are, are very, very calm. Could you tell at all from your perspective on the 57th floor that when the aircraft hits, which we think is about the 90th mm -hmm. floor, at right. least in the very top part of the right. building. How many floors were actually damaged at the time, or did people talk at all about the degree of damage that had been done just by the plane hitting before the building collapsed? It was a little hard to tell. You, you had some people coming down from the higher floors. Um, so you people know. were able to get from the higher floors down through yeah. the damaged part of the yeah. building? Well, uh, that I don't know. Yeah, okay. My sense is that they came down from floors under 90 and were able to get down above 90. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Um, I know that in Tower 2, I talked to someone from Tower 2, and they were able to get down from uh, around the 88th floor. Uh, they were evacuating. When our tower was hit, they were evacuating, and then their tower was hit. Uh, and even so, they were able to get down because they were on the right side of the building. Right. So, and, and were you there when first Tower 2 and then Tower 1 collapsed? Uh, well, I, was, I just had exited the building, and I was out on Church Street. And uh, tower, uh, the way I saw it, Tower Two came in. The South Tower came down first, and uh, I, I did. I did see that, yeah. And, and then I assume you ran. I ran like hell. Yeah, we've seen we've seen the video of people just yeah. running like yeah. hell in in every direction to get as far yeah. away as possible. And I think the tragedy is that the, the the police and fire personnel that were trying to help people out of that building the were right at ground zero when that happened. So you have to give them a lot of credit. And somebody said. We've said several times today when the, when the folks is running one way, the police and yeah. fire department are running and are running the other way, trying, absolutely true. trying to help. Anything uh, anything else aside from your survival, which strikes you at this several hours after we went through this horrible experience? Well, I mean, you know, it, I think everybody in this country believes we've got to find the people that did it, and we've got to deal with them. And you know, there is. I felt this way in 1993, and I think there is no stronger emotion. Uh, and you know, I'm sorry, but uh, this cannot happen in this country. Many thanks, Tom. I really appreciate you helping us to understand. That's Tom Humphreys, who works in a law firm in the Trade Tower. He was in the, in the North Tower on the 57th floor, and he walked out, and you've heard his story. And ABC's Charlie Gibson uh, has been trying to get a handle on some of the other st stories which are similar. Charlie? Well, Peter, we've been trying to keep track of the injury situation as it exists. Uh, obviously, the numbers of those who have died today, it's going to be some time before we have any estimates. And properly, people in New York and in Washington around the Pentagon are not commenting. They shouldn't because we don't have any concept. But as you reported a few moments ago, Mayor Giuliani uh, did talk about the numbers of injured saying at least, and these are very rough numbers, at least 2,100 people injured, 600 taken to hospitals, 1,500 walking wounded, he said, many of whom have been evacuated to New Jersey's Liberty State Park right across uh, the river, the Hudson River, from where the World Trade Centers were. And we have some further reports. Uh, ABC's Cynthia McFadden, who has been down in that area all day long, says that a triage center has been set up on the Chelsea Piers in New York City. Now, the Chelsea Piers is not a hospital area at all. It's an area of, that used to be uh, shipping piers along the Hudson River and lower Manhattan and uh, is now used for recreational purposes. There are tennis courts and golf driving ranges and uh, other things there, uh, meeting rooms, that kind of thing. It's a commercial operation. But uh, a triage center has been set up there and 50 makeshift operating rooms 
are being prepped and hundreds of ambulances are there waiting to take injured away from that facility, but they are doing treatment of people right uh, on the site or nearby uh, at Chelsea Piers. Reports from some of the hospitals uh, that are taking the injured. St. Vincent's Hospital here in New York, uh, the numbers again very rough, but an estimate of over 200 that have been taken in there, three dead, 18 in critical condition, and the most chilling quote that you can hear, uh, Dr. Stephen Stern there at St. Vincent's Hospital quoted it as saying, hundreds of people, hundreds of people coming in have been burned from head to toe. Bellevue Hospital reporting more than 100 patients brought in, two dead. Uh, Beth Israel reporting earlier that 70 patients had been brought in. There are some um, estimates from hospitals in Virginia near the Pentagon uh, of dozens of people having been brought in there. And the, I guess the heartening note in all this, uh, hospitals around New York who, that are not in the immediate vicinity of the World Trade Centers, um, people saying hundreds of donors are reportedly lined up to give blood outside Beth Israel Medical Center and some others uh, here in New York City. Um, and, and what I guess is a precursor of what is going to be the kinds of terrible news that we're going to get over the next few days, a spokesman at the medical examiner's office in New York City, the coroner's office, says that for now all of the bodies uh, that are being brought in dead bodies will go to the medical examiner's office on First Avenue here in New York. They say they have room for several hundred bodies and they are making room for more space since they anticipate more bodies will be brought in. Uh, one other note to mention, uh, at 4.30 this afternoon Eastern Time, the FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, uh, says that it has activated all 10 of FEMA's regional headquarters around the country. Uh, including those on the East Coast and then all the way west uh, as far as San Francisco and the state of Washington. They have activated all of those uh, regional headquarters, activated the federal response plan, which uh, FEMA says brings together 28 federal agencies and the American Red Cross, and 12 urban search and rescue teams are being dispatched. Eight of them are being sent here to New York and four to Washington, all deployed to search for victims of what has happened today. And the Health and Human Services Department uh, has activated a national medical emergency system. It's really an unprecedented move, uh, but it could dispatch nearly 7,000 volunteer doctors, nurses, pharmacists, other medical staff to areas that have been affected by today's attacks. So that brings you up somewhat to date on uh, what's being done in terms of those who have been injured and provisions now being made for those who've been killed today. Peter? Thank you, Charlie, very much. Uh, just to uh, try to keep the sort of sense or the proportion of casualties into some kind of, uh, in some kind of perspective, uh, the gentleman with whom we've just been talking, who worked in a law firm in the Northern Tower, uh, said that after the first aircraft uh, hit in, in, in that tower, which is 8.48 Eastern Time, this is one of those where were you when moments I'm just utterly convinced will be that way in, in, term, in historical terms. Where were you when? the first aircraft and then the second aircraft uh, crashed or were crashed into the Twin Trade Towers in New York City on this day, uh, the 11th of the month. And there's a timeline, if it's eight hours now since, uh, since this happened, and where Mayor Giuliani speaks just a few minutes ago, uh, they know of 2,100 people injured. And you see the pictures that the young man brought us from, from the absolute bottom, ground zero location. Uh, where, the, where the tower not only crashed on itself but then crashed down into the ground. There wasn't a sound there except the sound of flames licking up from underground and there was no sign of any person. And, and, and we know, because we've said it many times, that the, the fire department and the police department were going inwards, not outwards, when all of this happened. It's just absolutely impossible to get a grasp on it interested in, in, in the gentleman we spoke to a little while ago from the law firm, Tom, forgotten, I've probably gotten his last name. Say it out loud. Thank you, Tom Humphreys. Tom Humphreys, who said that it was his impression, at least in his building, in, in the North Tower, that a lot of people got out of that or had not arrived at work because it was, as he said, by New York standards, just a little earlier than people were accustomed. But, but when this young man, Mr. Sabiz, uh, brought his, his video that he'd taken he's on his just got on his motorbike up and then walked in uh, to, to this scene on the ground 
it is to realize that everybody's being kept, as Bill Lakemore subsequently confirmed for us, being kept at a distance from this at the site. And that's what's left on the left of the facade of the North Tower. ABC's Bob Jamison is downtown now. And Bob, we're looking at the pictures that have been brought to us by this young producer of a magazine. Can you just talk in general terms as you like? Well, generally speaking, Peter, uh, as the smoke uh, blows back and forth and uh, for a moment or two doesn't obscure both of the two World Trade Center buildings, you see so little. It's a, it's a tremendously eerie feeling to be in lower Manhattan looking down toward the tip of the island and seeing very few people, no traffic, uh, the smoke continuing to billow from these buildings, and nothing where there were once these two landmarks that drew everyone's attention, whether you drove or flew or came to New York by boat. Uh, but, Peter, there is a new concern, according to authorities, at this moment here in Lower Manhattan, and that is the growing fear that another building in the World Trade Center complex, which was not struck by an airplane, is in danger of collapsing. That is number seven World Trade Center, somewhat shorter, somewhat uh, with somewhat fewer stories than uh, numbers one and two. There is a fire burning vigorously in the lower floors of that building, threatening the foundation. And the building was already damaged some six hours ago now uh, when the North Tower collapsed and part of that.